Sean Croy, Prince and Jack Braun, Captain Flint, Brain Trust, Earl Sanderson, Silver Helix, Chop Chop, Young Troll, Stopwatch, Will and Wisp, Turtle, and Xavier Desmond. Hello, welcome to Card Table. So, uh, real briefly, um, you know, uh, as I've said before, I, I don't like really to focus on the negative, even in the books that I'm less excited about. Um, uh, but generally speaking, I, I, I can certainly say this: um, having having talked about the things that I like about Deuces Down and uh, Death Drops Five, um, particularly the new version of Deuces Down, which has some some cool new material that that really elevates the overall uh, volume. But certainly at the time, I will I will tell you this: uh, you know, loved the first fifteen books, um, was really excited about the whole iBooks relaunch, the fact that there was going to be more wild cards. Um, was pretty um, underwhelmed by Deuces Down the first time as a whole, even though I liked individual stories. Um, and then uh, Death Draws 5, at the time I thought, um, this is probably going to be it. Like there, There's not going to be any more wild cards after this. And I, I felt like as a final book in, a ser- in the series, Death Draws 5 didn't really work. You know, the, the, the earlier seeming final book, Black Trump, was far more climactic and finale-like and, and full circle-ish. So I was a little little underwhelmed by Death Draws 5 uh, uh, as well. I, I've sort of come to like it more as when I've reread it. I think I've said before one magical thing about wild cards um, is that the, the books do get, even the books that you maybe don't like the first time, <laughs> if you reread them, which I, I realize it's kind of, why would you reread a book you didn't like the first time? But uh, when it's a series where you're kind of like trying to follow a full series, you, you kind of you re, you re, like just like when you're binge watching a show you like you, you rewatch the the episodes maybe that you didn't like too so I have reread Wild Cards books that I didn't like as much the first time and they always even the ones I don't like that much um, they get better with a re- reread which is kind of a nice sort of happy happy quality of the books that um, they, they're so dense and there's so much going on even in even in the ones that you might not have liked the first time that um, when you when you read it a second time. You find oh there were there were things I missed the first time that were that are actually kind of cool, so that's kind of nice. Anyway, my point being that um, for me, my original reading experience was like Black Trump, the whole Card Sharks trilogy, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen, awesome, and then sixteen and seventeen felt like a real dip and possibly like the end, and like kind of kind of a peter out petered out way of of ending the series. Then they announced no no Tor has picked it up. And now uh, this uh, tour of the publisher, um, and eighteen Inside Straight is coming out, and it's going to be great. A- after the iBooks attempt at a relaunch, I was like, "Well, we'll see." If I'm going to be honest, uh, as Stephen Lee always encouraged me to be, <laughs> like when I called him his stories grotesque, I-, I I don't think I was expecting much from Inside Straight. I was kind of like, "Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe Wild Cards is kind of seen its day in the sun um, and doesn't need to be relaunched," and ended up being like kind of like yeah like blown away by insight or well maybe not blown away but really really happy (laughs) i really really loved inside straight and i'm trying to remember now the circumstances of when i first read it i have this weird kind of quasi memory of like reading it on a plane though i hardly ever travel so i don't know what that's about where am i going i remember the experience of reading it being like all over the place like being yeah being on a plane or a train and reading some of it on the train and uh, or in the, in the lobby of an airport, and, but some of it at home and some of it in whatever other state I was in and, <laughs> and then finishing it back home. Uh, just a really choppy reading experience for me, uh, uh, you know, my circumstances as a reader, but just, I couldn't put it down. Like I, you know, I could have waited and just said, I'll, I'll finish it when I get home. But I you know, took it on the trip with me and I just like, I. It was really compelling and just everything about it just worked so well for me. And I just remember like every story and every, um, just, just, or just about every story, uh, just hit, hitting just right. And, and just really the, the gestalt of it, like it, it was one of those where the way the stories worked in tandem with each other was, was really tight. It starts out kind of being, kind of seeming like it's maybe going to be kind of low stakes, um, because it's just about this uh, superhero reality show, although they don't call them superheroes, but a reality show for aces, uh, essentially called American Hero. Um, you know, you know, this, this book was published in 2007 or 2008 when, you know, 
obviously, you know, Survivor and American Idol and all those. Um, you know, I mean, it, I guess reality TV is is still pretty much a thing, but but back then it was really a thing. It was like a huge uh, thing in the zeitgeist. It was everywhere. Um, so it made perfect sense for for wild cards to uh, tap into that. But of course, that does seem kind of like weirdly low stakes. You know, at first it's like, you know, Ace is just kind of worried about being the next person to be voted off, uh, voted off the <laughs> voted off the show. Um, but then it it it's, it, it very uh, very cleverly segues uh, into being about this this uh, Middle Eastern conflict, um, which is sort of always timely it was it's another really timely element of the book uh, for when it came out but conflict in the middle east you know sadly is sort of always timely i guess but it it allows them to kind of tie back into the whole john fortune uh prophecy where you know it's, you know i've talked about how that was one of the really longitudinal arcs where in volume 4 when peregrine goes to egypt there's these uh egyptian god characters who are just aces and jokers with the with either the um, the powers and or the appearances of the the, Egypt, the ancient Egyptian pantheon of, of deities, and uh, one of them has the power of foresight and, and tells Peregrine that her unborn child is going to be very powerful and very important. And then John Fortune, uh, at this point, is now you know twenty one year uh, twenty years old or, or thereabouts. Um, we last saw him in Death Draws Five when he was. Uh, is 14 or 6 I think 16 I believe the Egyptian god characters have like kind of a cameo but definitely did not really explain the prophecy um I think that was one of the reasons I was kind of actually disappointed by Death Draws 5 originally because it was like wait what about the prophecy you finally brought back John Fortune what about that prophecy and so that that bugged me and so Inside Straight uh John Joseph Miller um who whose wife Gail Gerstner Miller wrote the original prophecy story and John Joseph Miller wrote Death Draws Five. Um, in this in this book, uh, he, he brings John uh, brings back John Fortune, and and it turns out, oh, Death Draws Five was not the end of the John Fortune thing. It was just more like kind of a, a reigniting of it. And here in, in this book is when we really get the payoff, because um, there's the, there's a MacGuffin in the form of this amulet that one of the Egyptian gods gave to Peregrine. And what was that amulet? What was that all about? You know, we never we never saw, we never saw it again, but we see it in Inside Straight and it's all explained. And uh, I seem to recall reading, um, I believe it was Ian Tregillis wrote an essay kind of going a little bit into the behind the scenes of Inside Straight about how when all the, all the original stories were kind of put together into a book, like put in together in the proper sequence, they realized there were some gaps in the narrative and Ian Tregillis was called upon to fill one of those gaps, which I'll talk about in a second. But John Joseph Miller was called upon to fill in the other one with a John Fortune story, which, if that's true, that's crazy, because <laughs> it's one of the things that seems to tie the whole book together. Like, that, that would have been a huge gap originally, because that John Joseph Miller story is key to the whole thing. It seems crazy if that, that wasn't part of the original plan, that that was something that they noticed afterward was missing. Uh, but that probably just speaks to this, the chaos of trying to to write a novel or an, or an anthology slash quasi novel, you know, by committee. Of course, you know it's it's going to be tricky. Um, but but they you know they recognize that something was missing and they plugged the gap and um, now and then it, it's it's great and, and uh, I think I even told John Joseph Miller online at the time I was like, hey, hey man, I'll make a confession. Uh, I thought Death Draws Five was missing something and now I realize it's because the story wasn't done and. And uh, yeah, I loved seeing the John Fortune saga develop further in Inside Straight. Super cool. And uh, one of the cool things about this book. But yeah, so the whole Middle Eastern conflict, the, the, the Temple of the Living Gods, as they're called, who reside in Egypt, uh, you know, become em em embroiled in that whole conflict. And so the book kind of, like I say, it's, 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 it's real. It's, it's so, it's incredibly clever and, and deceptively, they make it look deceptively easy the way the book segues from this like trite American reality show to this heavy duty uh, conflict, you know, in, in this other part of the world that, and how characters kind of slowly segue from being part of the one plot to part of the other. Uh, it's just really cool the way it's done. Um, and just everyone, everyone is, uh, every, every author is just de deployed so strategically. It just, it feels... Uh, it feels like one of the most strategic wildcards books in the sense of how they deploy 
authors and characters, you know, how certain characters are, are introduced early as, as not the POV character, you know, as seemingly just a supporting character. Um, only, you know, so that later in the book, their, their creator slash author, um, thinking of like Drummer Boy, uh, who's a character created by, um, I guess it's okay to say this, uh, Stephen Lee, <laughs> writing under a, a pseudonym, but it's Stephen Lee writing about Drummer Boy. But Drummer Boy doesn't pay him the lead character till near the end. Stephen Lee draws, writes this kind of climactic part of the book from the perspective of the Drummer Boy character. But Drummer Boy is there throughout the entire book as seemingly as this kind of almost irritant to other characters, uh, you know, and then it, and then at the end, uh, he ends up becoming the lead character for a very significant moment in the in the book. And there are lots of things like that in this book. Ian Tregillis writes his character. He's got a couple different names because he's called Rust Belt or, or Rusty or Wally. He sort of has two nicknames. It sort of seems like he, he's claimed two very cute nicknames. He's both Wally and Rusty. But it's another one where it's like, wow, this wasn't supposed to be here originally. Like it was it, like Ian Tregillis talks about in that behind the scenes essay. There was no Rusty story originally. Rusty was just a side character. And then Ian Tregillis had to fill this gap in the narrative. And so he was asked to just write a, a story from Rust Belt's perspective. And that becomes another another one where it's like becomes almost the sort of emotional heart of the book. Uh, and it's it's another one where you go, huh, oh, so this wasn't part of the original plan. That's crazy. But again, like, again, like, it just seems like perfect strategic de- deployment of Tregillis and perfect use of his talents because he's, he's very good at kind of eliciting a, a kind of emotional response using relatively few words. You know, it's a pretty short story, uh, but it kind of, he kind of gets your heartstrings by the end of it. Melinda Snodgrass, um, who I always thought was a really economical writer who's really good at, um, kind of developing uh, these kind of intricate like kind of clockwork plots in these in these very short stories here she writes very short stories she just kind of writes these it, it's sort of in three parts um, and each each part the, the part one is at the very start might even be the very first thing in the book or second thing very early um, the third part is like right at the end you know practically an epilogue and then the middle part is kind of right in the middle of the book so she's she, Snodgrass again, strategic deployment, you know, because you've got Snodgrass, a really seasoned writer, you know, has written for television, and you know, which is another kind of writer's room, a bit like Wild Cards in the sense of it being a writer's room, story by committee and whatever. So you've got a veteran in the form of Snodgrass, sort of, you know, there there to get things going at the start, develop things in the middle, and then bring things in, into a nice little uh, tied into a nice little bow at the end. Really, really nicely done. Uh, George R. R. Martin himself, who um, I, I believe it's the last, I think Inside Straight marks the last time he actually has contributed prose to a Wild Cards book, because apparently he's really busy with some other series. I don't know anything about that. That's none of my business. He still is, you know, the, the, the editor on all these books, although in some cases Melinda Snodgrass has kind of taken the lead, and there might at this point there might be a couple books that are solely edited by Snodgrass, but still, I mean, you know, Martin still definitely has his hand in, in these books, but not as a, a writer of prose. Um, so Inside Straight is kind of, uh, it's always possible Martin will come back and, and contribute prose again, but it's possible Inside Straight marks his last, his last prose contribution to Wild Cards. Uh, but it's great, you know, it's his only post, you know, post Game of Thrones uh, wild cards prose. Not to act like I'm an expert on the on the sort of <laughs> arc of, of George R. R. Martin's writing style, but it feels a little different. It doesn't feel quite like the same Martin uh, who wrote, you know, the, for the first 15 books. And I love that stuff too, but this feels kind of almost on another level. It feels really intense. And uh, he comes in and writes this story right around the time, right around the time when the book transitions to being from being mostly about the reality show with a little bit of that Middle Eastern conflict sprinkled in to the other way around where it really, sh- he, he sort of, Martin kind of provides the hinge for that point in the book where it becomes a little bit about that reality show, but mostly about this intense war in the Middle East. It's also kind of part of a little little trilogy of, 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 of stories in the middle uh, where these three characters, uh, Jonathan Hive, John Fortune, and uh, Lonegren, uh, Lonegren is George R. R. Martin's character, and of course John Fortune is, at this point, has kind of been adopted by John Joseph Miller, uh, even though the character was created by his wife, Gil Gerstner Miller. And then Jonathan Hive is created by Daniel Abraham, who I mentioned makes an, an amazing Wild Cards debut in Deuces Down. Uh, in this book, 
Abraham actually writes the interstitial. Uh, Abraham is a brilliant writer. So once again, great strategic deployment. Get a really, really, really brilliant guy to do your interstitial for your big tour relaunch. Uh, about Jonathan Hive, who is a character that I love. I remember being at a wild card signing, and, and I had this big crate with like... <laughs> all 15 or all at that point it was uh 23 books at that point in the series and i had all 23 in some cases multiple editions of some of the books big gigantic crate everyone behind me in line at this signing probably hated me just having every writer sign every book whatever or trying to trying to find the ones like okay who's in front of me now this is you know walter john williams okay so that's book one and two and anyway Point being, uh, Melinda Snodgrass and George R. R. Martin were sitting next to each other, and they sort of asked me, so as a fan, going back to the beginning, who are your favorite characters? Because um, we're, we're trying to think, like, who do we want to be the stars of the Wild Cards TV show? And I started naming all these kind of classics, you know, from the first 15 books. And they were like, well, who do you like in the new books, like, since the tour relaunch? And I was like, um... <laughs> I just kind of went blank. Not that there aren't any, but I just kind of went blank because, again... Uh, as I mentioned last time, the newer books I haven't, I just haven't reread as many times, you know, so that they're not quite as, or at least at the time of that signing, I had probably only read them once, you know, so I was like, well, um, but the first one that came to mind was Jonathan Hive, the Daniel Abraham character that's created for Inside Straight, a uh, character who can, just this kind of smarmy, smart-ass character that uh, kind of is almost like the spiritual heir uh, to the to this kind of snarky Jay Aykroyd character that George R. R. Martin created. There's a part in one of the books where Jonathan Hyde meets Jay Aykroyd and, and thinks to himself, I want to I want to be Jay Aykroyd when I grow up. I thought that's almost meta. But yeah, so yeah, Jonathan Hive is he he's the interstitial character, so he's throughout. But one of the longer Jonathan Hive pieces works kind of in tandem with with uh, the John Joseph Miller John Fortune story and the Martin's Lonegren story where those three characters kind of all go to Egypt. Those three characters just have such a great uh, synergy. Um, Lohengrin is, is this very straight-laced, kind of, you know, o overly serious kind of character. It takes everything very solemnly and seriously. Um, you know, whereas Jonathan Hive is the is the snarky one. It's, it's, it's just that, that kind of classic kind of buddy cop, odd couple kind of pairing. And... Uh, it's great that because Martin writes from Lohengrin's POV and then Jonathan Hive writes, or uh, Daniel Abraham writes from Jonathan Hive's POV, we get the odd couple from both sides, like from both perspectives, and uh, works so beautifully. And it's kind of right it's sort of in the middle of the book. And uh, just a wonderful sequence uh, that, that just works so nicely. And there are also just some great, uh, even some of the uh, reality show drama is is surprisingly involving you know when you think how can that possibly work like a reality show in prose it just seems absurd i think carrie vaughn whose idea it was i think she's done a behind the scenes about how it was just uh it, it wasn't something that she pitched as a premise for a book she pitched it as backstory for one of her characters that the character had appeared on a reality show called american hero and Martin and or Snodgrass kind of kind of looked at that and said, oh, that's intriguing. And, and they were like, what if that's actually the, the plot? Um, so that, that whole thing was kind of Carrie Vaughan's brainchild. And she, she probably writes what I think is probably the best reality show portion of the book uh, with the character of, um, of uh, Ana Cortez, uh, whose who's American hero name is Earth Witch, who, who strikes up this friendship with this sort of uh, America's sweetheart type of character called Curveball. And that, that friendship is, is another, if Rust Belt's little little vignette near the end of the book is kind of the heart of the book near the end, uh, the, the early part of the book, the friendship between Anna and uh, Kate, a.k.a. Curveball, is sort of the heart of the reality show portion. Uh, just this very kind of sweet, very enjoyable you know, friendship between between two women who just kind of respect and, and, and love each other. And uh, I, I think if I'm remembering right, uh, going back to that, <laughs> when I was put on the spot by, by George and Melinda of, of who are my fav favorite characters post-relaunch, I would have named Jonathan Hive, might have named Ramshead, uh, who we'll get to. But I think I named Curveball as well. Um, I, you know, an, an America's Sweetheart character is... Uh, um, I'm all for one of those. Just a cool, you know, badass chick with a heart of gold. So another thing I'll say about this book um, is that it 
more so than other books in the series, this one really does feel kind of like you can imagine the writers interacting the way television writers would in a writer's room in the sense that uh, in other Wild Cards anthologies, when, when, say, writer A has character X and that's their character, and they, they write about that character and that character's supporting cast, and there might, you know, certainly there might be connections to other parts of, of the Wild Cards universe and other characters, but they're, they're a little bit more modular. And I mean, they, they are very interconnected, but, and so may, maybe it's, maybe I'm not going to be able to explain this uh, just off the top of my head without really thinking it through. But because of, but because of the reality show element of this one, the everyone's all the characters supporting cast is kind of just the other writers' characters because all, all the writers had to create uh, you know characters to be part of this reality show American Hero, um, and so you know so for example like in the in the stuff with uh, Anna Cortez, Earthwitch, and and Kate, uh, aka Curveball, their supporting cast includes you know Jonathan Hive, and Drummer Boy. Uh, and and Rust Belt and you know all these characters who then become leads and and then the supporting cast is you know Curveball and Earthwitch, you know and then you know in Jonathan Hive's story, um, you know again the supporting characters are you know John Fortune and Lone Grin and then in the Lone Grin story, the supporting characters are Jonathan Hive and John Fortune and then by the time you get to the drummer drummer boy story, his supporting characters are Curveball, <laughs> you know John Fortune, Jonathan Hive so. The, the writers really share their characters a lot, which um, it's, not, it's not totally unusual. Again, like that, that's kind of what Wild Cards is all about. But this one really, and maybe it's because it's the debut of all these characters. Like a lot of times when you look at like the way some characters and stories develop in the, in the first phase of Wild Cards, the first time you meet a character, they are kind of on their own. And it's just the writer develops their lead character and that character's supporting cast and milieu and then it's only later that that you start to see more crossover. Um, whereas in this book, like right from the start, all these characters are kind of part of the same, you know, reality TV show, and they're all they're all intermingling right from the start. It really does feel like this ensemble cast, and every writer who contributes to Inside Straight has to write them all and has to get everyone's voices down right away. Not just their own characters, but. You know, every 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 writer has to has to be able to write a good Jonathan Hive because he's he's everywhere, and every writer has to be able to write Curveball in character and Rust Belt in character because they're just omnipresent throughout the book. And usually, that's something that you sort of see happen maybe in like the third book of a triad. You know, after the first two books introduced all the new players, then you start to see them really interact and commingle. But in this one, they're they're commingling from the moment you first meet them. Uh, and I, that, that's always struck me as a difference about Inside Straight. Um, and, and I guess kind of a difference in, in just the approach to wild cards in the tour era. Um, cause you'll kind of see it again when you get to volume 21, Fort Freak, which is the introduction of the, 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 um, the, the cop shop, the, the fifth precinct in New York, which is the, the Joker town precinct. Um, cause that's kind of the same thing. Like all the stories kind of set. In, in the offices of the of the Joker Town precinct, and so all the cops are just always around, and and the supporting character in in one story is the lead character in the next, and all the writers have to write all the characters. Um, so it's 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 the new it's the new way, I guess. Inside Straight signals kind of a change in that respect. I don't, I don't know if I'm totally explaining the distinction. Uh, if if it sounds like maybe I'm cutting it too fine, I don't know. But certainly when you read it, it feels a little different. It feels like like just like all the writers have to have to know everybody's character really well right from the start, um, as opposed to just being able to focus on their own character at first, you know, before starting to 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 grab characters from other other uh, writers. But yeah, I guess apart from that, yeah, like I say, the big takeaway is that, um, and this might be another thing that seems like a really fine distinction that you could say, well, isn't this true of all the books? But that idea of like really strategic deployment of just every writer just seems to be doing like the perfect thing uh, to make this particular book work. Um, everyone just seems to be uh, deployed at the perfect spot in the book uh, where their talents are just put to like perfect use. Uh, you know, like I say, like putting Snodgrass at the beginning and the end and the middle um, in these, in these little key points, uh, putting George R. R. Martin right at kind of that hinge point when the book kind of changes focus, um, having Daniel Abraham be the guiding interstitial man, um, 
um, letting letting Carrie Vaughn be the writer early on to really give you a feel for that reality show milieu uh, in such a way that you actually care about it. Uh, bringing Stephen Lee in uh, with his very evocative writing style for the for a very hugely climactic moment. Bringing in Ian Tregillis to uh, to create this very like sentimental kind of touching moment right at a, at a, at a key moment just before the big climax. Uh, bringing in John Joseph Miller to uh, to continue the the John Fortune thread at just the right time, it, it all works and it all just blends together uh, really nicely and it's just it feels really magical and I remember uh, thinking like Wild Cards really is back like this is like the real thing um, and being like so delighted and it and it holds up really well too I've I've done a couple of rereads of Inside Straight it's not just the like I kind of mentioned the whole context of like. 16 and 17 being a little weak for me the first time. And and so I had kind of low expectations the first time I read Inside Straight. But, you know, when I reread it, I reread it going, I remember this one being really awesome. Is it going to hold up? And it does. Like, it's it's awesome on the rereads, too. So it's it's not it's nothing to do with low expectations. Like, it's the real deal. It's a really successful book, I think. Such a, such a triumph and, and such a high point in the series. As always, I've belabored the point, but in this case, I really wanted to belabor... Uh, how much I like this one, because it really is a favorite. So um, that's it for now, and uh, next time we will continue on our journey through the entire Wildcard series. So until then. But before we get going, may I highly recommend Cod Shocks? I like to go out dancing. My baby loves a bunch of authors. Lately we've had some friction, because my baby's hooked on shared world fiction.